promises are true, you're faithful. You cover all my sins with forgiveness. My eyes will see you ways, your goodness, your faithfulness in me. stream we hope that you feel the love and warmth of the friendly church here at southwest community church before we continue praise and worship let's go to the lord in prayer heavenly father i just thank you for this sunday i thank you that we are able to come together as one father being able to come together with everyone who's walking into this building carrying something with them father whether it's this, the stresses and the scars faced from the obstacles of this past week, whether it's an emotional baggage, Father, whether it's an emotion that we can't seem to shake, a feeling, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, whether it's just not feeling peace wherever we are, Father, I just pray that we would remember we are able to be remade and made new in this building, Father, as you are overseeing us, that you are able to fill in all the gaps that we aren't able to have the answers to, that you're able to fill in all the gaps for when we need that strength, when we need that answer, when we need that solution, Father, you are there for us. 
And I just pray that as we walk through this life, that we wouldn't grow old, that we wouldn't grow weary, that we wouldn't grow cynical in our faith, Father, but that we would just feel that excitement, that we'd feel that hope that no matter what life throws our way, when we choose to rely on you, you will see us through. We just thank you, Father. Pray that you'd bless this church. Give Pastor Cody the words of wisdom. We pray in your heavenly name. Amen. Thank you.
foundation He'll never let me down and I put my faith in Jesus My anchor to the My hope and firm foundation He'll never let me down and I put my faith in Jesus My anchor to the ground to your children. Lord, you have never let us down and never will you let us down. You're faithful and you're true, Lord, in all the things that you say and that you do. Lord, I pray that we would remember in our lowest of lows and our highest of highs that we have a God who is behind us. We have a God who is before us. Lord, so what man can man do to me? Lord, help us to stand firm in the truths of Your Word as we go through them, as we study them, Lord. Lord, help us to hold on to the promises, the promise of eternity, the promise that You say, never will I leave You and never will I forsake You. The promise that You tell us, Lord, that You're working all things to good. Lord, I pray that everybody here today that walks through these doors, every one of us has baggage we all have issues that we're struggling and dealing with help us to hand them over to the God who cares to the God who's able we pray this in Jesus name and all God's people said Amen. thank you man be seated the kids are dismissed to meet their teachers in the back And we have a junior church for all ages, up to sixth grade. And um, we also have the cry room in the corner. We have a nursery in the back, but we have the cry room in the corner. So if your kid gets fussy or needs a quick change and uh, you, you would like to stay with them, you can. Um, you just walk out this right here. You go to the right, and that's the cry room. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out, follow along. We have the notes in the back that you could scribble on, and uh, you can also scan and get the verses that way. Uh, but if you can, just make your way there as we uh, continue in our series, Dry Bones. Let me ask you guys, have you ever had a time when you cut off from everything? Right? You just cut off from everything else. Maybe it was a vacation where you had everybody in the family take their cell phones and like put them in a box or something like that, or you weren't allowed to check your phone or something. Um, maybe it was uh, you made an agreement with your wife or the kids or whoever it may have been that 
when you got home that you were not going to talk about work or check any you know, emails from work or anything like that. It was just a time to detach and to focus. You know, we have a tendency to do that when it comes to things we really enjoy, right? Like, we could detach ourselves for two and a half hours to watch a game or to go to a movie. Uh, you know, we could detach ourselves from all the things that are going around and we dedicate time to whatever it is. We dedicate mind power to whatever it is that we're doing, right? During COVID, me and Elijah, we would dedicate hours to doing puzzles. It was like as soon as school was done and that, that laptop went away, and how annoying was that, right? Kudos to all you teachers out there that had to deal with that time. But he would shut that thing and run over and we'd just spend hours doing puzzles, right? Found joy in puzzles once again, right? When I was in school, my teacher, um, she would tell us, go ahead and place all your things under your desk. And as soon as she said that, we knew it was coming next. We got so excited. It was just like, ah, we know what's coming. And she would say, it's time. But that's as far as she got because we would throw all of our stuff under the desk and we would line up, right? Because we knew there was that excited anticipation of what was coming next. It was my favorite class in school. Now, if you ask my brother, he always said, because I was a little chubby, that my favorite class in school was cafeteria. But... <laughs> This was truly my favorite class in school. It was PE time, right? I loved going out there and there was no algebra, there was no English, there was no history. There was none of that stuff, right? It was me on the field running against all my teammates and against all the other kids in school. That's what I loved. I loved the competition of it. I had no concern about anything else. If I had gotten in trouble with the teacher that day, it was erased out there in PE, right? Why? Because that was a designated time for me. And as we step into the book of Haggai, I want you guys to kind of pull that sort of thinking, that sort of idea of designating time. Because the Lord tells the Israelites, and really if he's telling them, and, and the application is true today, he's telling us to drop all things, to drop all pretenses. Get rid of all other thoughts. Get rid of all other actions and all the things that you're striving for and towards because it's him time. In my house, we have this, this, this thing, basically, that when somebody has asked you for their time, you put away your cell phone, you put away computer and stuff like that, any other distraction, and you designate time just for them. Right? I hate it when you get into a conversation with somebody and they're just there with their, you know, laptop, and they're just there like, oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's true, yeah. And you're like, did you hear a single thing, you know, I feel like Chris Tucker in Rush Hour. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, right? It's horrible. It, you know they're distracted, and you know they don't care a single lick about what you just said. You can tell them that, you know, hey, guess what? I just signed up for a you know, scientific experiment, and they've been injecting me with ooze the past three weeks. And they're just like, oh, yeah, that's great. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. Ooze. Yeah, I heard about that in Ninja Turtles or something, you know? But when we designate time, when we cut all other things off, you're telling that person how important they are to you. Open your Bibles to Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 2. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says, The time has not come. Even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. 
So right off the bat, we step into a scenario where God's saying, guess what? The, the people of Israel, they're coming and they're saying, you know what, God, we don't have time for you. It's not time. We're not going to do this. I'm cutting you off, Lord. So you could see and you could sense that God is a little ticked off right now. I love the way Tony Evans says when a believer gets ticked off, it's evangelically ticked off. And you could see that from the Lord coming here. Verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses while this house Lies desolate? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but the harvest is little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothes, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. In these verses, we find the reprimand that God is giving to the nation Israel. God says to His people, you made time to fix your homes. You made time to get into the market. You made time to go get married. You made time to get your life together. But where is my time? You guys keep on telling me, it's not time for you, Lord. It's time for me. This is my time. Sitting on the computer distracted. Do you know how many times I've heard believers say something very similar to this? They say they're going to get serious about the Lord and their walk with the Lord later on. I'll serve the Lord when I retire. I'll start regularly going to church when I have kids. You know how many young people I hear that from? I'll start getting serious with the Lord and and stuff like that when I have kids. I'll start reading the Bible when I'm done with school. I'll start giving when I'm out of debt. All of that takes place when? Oh man, I'm going to have to go into uh, English with you guys. Grammar. That's what? Future tense. It's all future tense. You're saying, I'm going to do it later. When we don't build habits now, they never come. And we teach our kids and we teach our grandkids. We teach our our nieces and our nephews that the future time is the Lord's, but this time right now is what? Mine. Have you ever felt like time was just going and you were making every effort to try and stay at pace? It's like your every effort is trying to make it through the day. And that's what God is speaking of here to the Israelites. He's like, hey, guess what? You know what? You're going to go out and you're going to sow, but you're not going to have enough to to reap. You're going to go ahead and you're going to work to put money in your pocket, but it's going to feel like there's a hole in your pocket. Why? Because it's never going to be enough when you're not making time for the right things in life. When you're only making time for me, myself, and I, then you'll never have enough. It's like every effort goes to yourself. Then we add on tomorrow, right? Right? The next day, the next day, and the day after that, and we start worrying about those days. We start planning for those days, right? School, marriage, kids, and on and on and on. And it becomes tedious, right? Your calendar just starts to weigh you down, and you're like, where can I ever come up to just breathe? Go and take in the kids to sports, and then you have this event, and then you have that event, and you have to do this and that, right? 
Well, there's an answer to all the madness this world likes to dump on us and make us worry and freak out about. There's an answer to all the, the, the things that we worry about and we keep on trying to strive for. The Lord, He just makes it clear for us to take a look and to sit back and calm. Take a look with me at Matthew 6, 33 and 34. After going through all the different things in life that man truly works to strive for, food and clothing and a house and things of that nature, Jesus says these words, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these will be added unto you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus is saying, hey, listen, you know what? It's funny, you're worried about all the future things that can happen in life. And you know what? There's new things that you're going to have to worry about tomorrow. So why worry about the, the issues of tomorrow that haven't even taken place today? You need to focus on heavenly things. Focus on your heavenly relationship with your Father who cares about you. So, how can we just hand it all over to God and not worry? How can we just go ahead and make the time when, when we're not making the time, when it feels like there's not enough time, and we're looking at our life and we're like, where can I place God in my calendar tomorrow? How is it that we should just focus on Him Well, it's because we're too busy to see what truly matters. You see, our life is so small and it's so tiny when it's it's truly looked at, when we take a look at our life, when we analyze our life, if we take a look at really our lifespan, we really don't have much time here on earth compared to eternity. And so the issue is, we're living for a time rather than living for an eternity. And that's what I want you to take in a moment and assess in your own life and ask yourself just truly, let's, let's throw off all the things that we put on ourselves, all the masks that we like to wear, all the, all the pretenses that we have. Let's just get soul naked for a moment, right? Right? And I want you just to say to yourself, am I living for a time or am I living for eternity? Am I living for a time or am I living for eternity? You can honestly answer yourself, if you are leaving a legacy here on earth, then you're living for eternity. But if you're living for yourself and keeping up with the Joneses and the things around you, then you're living for a time. The issue is living for a time or eternity. The word seek in the Greek here is the word zetiot, meaning to search out inquire, investigate, to reach a binding terminal resolution. You're literally trying. You're seeking it out. You're trying to come with an understanding. You're not just going through life, right? You're wanting to understand. You want a resolution to this. And to the Hebrews, it had an even deeper meaning. When you said you were going to seek the Lord, when you were going to seek His kingdom, right? When you are being told by Jesus to seek His kingdom, right? And all these things will be added to you. To the Hebrews, it literally meant to seek God through your worship. 
Because that's where you truly come closer to Him. And what Jesus is letting us know is that our time for worship is all the time. And so we're not just supposed to put Jesus in our box of, okay, here's Sunday, Jesus. And here's Wednesday from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. That's your time, Jesus. No. He's letting us know that all the time that we live on this earth is His time. So live in His time. Because His time leads to eternity. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So in essence, we're being called to stop worrying about things, stop freaking about issues, the tests, the problems, and the future pains that, you know what, we don't even know if we're going to have. But focus on what matters right now. Focus on the things that matter, in fact, past the right now. Focus on the things that go past your tomorrow. Focus on the things that affect not just a year from now, and not just two years from now, and not just five years from now. Think of the things that are going to have an effect when you're gone. The things that truly matter. And what is that going to be? It's going to be your relationship with people and your relationship with the Lord. Focus on the worship that you have in Christ in your everyday. You know, you can be the best representation of Christ in every instance in life. That's why we're called ambassadors of Christ. That's why we're called foreigners to this land. Because we're a representation of Him when we're at work. We're a representation of Him when we're standing before our kids. We're a representation of Him when we're talking to our friends. And, and sadly, and I'm not meaning this to condemn anyone, but sadly, we're the only representation, we're the only image of Christ that some people will ever see. It's estimated only 3% of all of South Florida considers themselves Bible-believing Christians. They say right now that the church, people are leaving the church in droves. We're not seeing that effect here in Miami as, as much as the rest of the nation is, but people are leaving the church in droves. Why? Because they don't see a representation of Jesus there. Why? Because people are, are cutting off Jesus from their time. They're being greedy of Jesus in their time. And they're saying, Lord, You can't come into this area of my life, but what we need to do is get serious about our relationship with Jesus while we're here on earth. We need to invite Him into all areas of our life. And I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying it's going to hurt, because it is. But it's worth it. The Lord knocks at our life and says, now is the time I want in. But for some reason, a lot of times us believers, we like to think, well, Lord, you have all my eternity, so right now I'm going to live for me. But the idea here that we're being told by Jesus is that we need to live with our eternity in mind. Why? Why? Because it all has to do with the quality of our eternity that we'll spend with Him, right? Oh man, I want to, to rule and reign with Jesus. I mean, it's okay if I'm uh, uh, you know, sweeping the, the, the floors in somebody's mansion, God's you know, kingdom. That's fine. I'm cool with that. You know? But man, just to, to hear the well done, my good and faithful servant. How exciting would that be? Focus on the worship that you have in Christ. Focus on building your life and your relationship with Him. Drop all else. Your worries, your struggles, your doubts. Freeze those for Him. Put them aside just for a moment. In Haggai, Israel, they going back to our passage the Lord comes to them and he's, he's just reprimanding them and He's saying, listen, Israel, you live in paneled housing. 
Why, why, is that, why is that so important in this passage? Well, Israel had been taken over by Babylon, right? They had been taken over by nation after nation after nation. We talked a little bit about that last week. And, and it had been a number of time. It had been a number of years. And there's this decree that goes out. You know what? It's not right for us having taken over Israel to go ahead and let their land be desolate. In fact, the way that it, it, it had been approached by Nehemiah, he stands before the king and he says, hey listen, the land and the, and the tombs of my ancestors are being left open. And to the emperor, that was a horrible thing. You can't let the tombs of the ancestors be left open and desolate and gross and disgusting. And he says, you go ahead and you go take care of your people. So he goes back into the land. They start rebuilding and, and, and they're, they're rebuilding the walls, right? And it's just, a, it's just an exciting time in Israel. And people start... Moving back into the land of Israel, the people that were dispersed, they start coming back. And then Cyrus says, hey, guess what? We're going to do something even better. We're going to go ahead and we're going to cut the wood and we're going to send it into Israel so they can rebuild their temple. And as the supplies start to come in, it says here that the Lord looks at at the people and what they're doing to their housing and, and what they're doing. And as the temple just stood there desolate, burnt down as it had been left. The people are rebuilding their houses. They're, they're spending money on their houses and, and putting outside paneling. I mean, whoa, they're really going, going for broke here, right? I mean, I guess today, if we're going to put it in today's terms, it's like you walk into the kitchen and it's like, whoa, man, that's a kitchen, right? You got two ovens. Woo! You splurged. But they were avoiding the place that drew them in together. They were avoiding the place that truly made them the nation Israel. They, they were avoiding going to and fixing the place that made them the people they were avoiding going to the place that made them the called out ones, right? The, the people of God, which was the temple, which for us would be like the church, right? And the, and the sad thing is, is in Ezra 3.7, they, they went out to fix the temple in Jerusalem and they gave... They were given money to buy cedar timbers from Lebanon and, and to use it in the temple, but from what we see within this passage, that money actually in the timbers never made it into the temple. They used it for their own homes. So that's why God is saying, I see the panels that were bought from my temple and they're lining the side of your house. God is saying, my home is wasting away. And it's in bad shape, but wow, compared to your house. Take a look at verse 7 and 8 back in Haggai chapter 1 again with me if you would. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. In this, we have the answer in two verses. We have a remedy, right? So we have the rebuke, we have the remedy. We read the rebuke, right? We already looked at it. The Lord's getting mad at them because they're doing all these things, they're doing wrong. They're, they're saying, it's not time, it's my time, I'm going to do this in my time, and Lord, it's not your time yet. And then the Lord says, no, 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 this is my time, you're going to do this. We're going to make the house of the Lord something special. Make God's house your home, right? That's what He's calling them to do. It's time to stop focusing on external focus and focus on the eternal. Take a look at verses 9-11 to with me if you would. He continues, You look for much, 
but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I will blow it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house which lies desolate, while each of you runs into his own home. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, and on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. Here we have the rebuke. We have the reprimand, where God is saying this is wrong. We have the remedy, go up into the mountains and make it right, get the wood, start fixing things, make it my time, and then we have the rebuke. He's really letting them have it. This is the moment when mom comes home after saying, hey, I'm going grocery shopping. Kids, you go ahead and make sure the dishes are done and clean your room, right? And what ends up happening? Oh, I remember when I was a kid, we used to get that all the time, right? That was back when there wasn't a Publix on every corner. You had to drive a little ways away, and it took your parents two hours to go grocery shopping. We always joked around and said they were going to the movies. But that was back in the day when literally it took a while to go grocery shopping. And, and we would do, you know, everything but clean our rooms. I remember one day we actually got into a water gun fight in the house. Yeah, my sister, she didn't have a water gun, so she used a turkey baster. Didn't really work well. But we were just, you know, I'm there, I have my super soaker, my brother and sister are going against me, my brother had this little water pistol. We're all, you know, teenagers. And we're squirting water all around the house, and my bedroom was the one that actually faced the, the you know, driveway, and I see my dad's truck pull in. And there was just water everywhere. It was really bad. And I go, oh no, mom and dad are home. And we ran around like crazy people, hiding the water guns. We had towels everywhere. We're wiping everything down, right? And my mom comes in, and the first words are out of her mouth are, cochino, right? She was not happy. I work all day and you do this to the house and your room. I can't believe it. She, she was so furious. But she was right. We were fooling around. We were doing everything but what she asked us to do. It's the moment when dad comes home from a long day of work, man. He's exhausted. He's tired. I remember I used to go ahead and my dad, he would get home and it was really late because he worked really late nights doing construction. And he would come in and he would want to give me a hug and a kiss goodnight at least before he went to bed, right before I went to bed. He came home at about 8.30 or so. And I was one of those kids that loved to play Legos. Right? And I had this really thick carpet in my room. And I always missed like a few Legos. And like the first thing my dad did when he came home is he took off his boots because they were filthy and he left them at the door. And he would walk up and he would go to give my sisters a kiss goodnight, my brother a kiss goodnight, and me and a kiss goodnight. And 90% of the time he would walk in, he would find the Legos I missed with his feet. It was kind of like, oh man, I work all day for this. Ah, right? And Legos are the worst. When you step on Legos with no shoes on, it's like the most painful little thing. I think the, the Swedish do that intentionally. <laughs> yeah, they're neutral, all right, but they've caused a war on your feet, right? Well, God is letting the kids have it here. Because while they were away, they were doing everything but. The Lord is saying, hey, listen, you guys, when I've given you time, you've taken advantage of the time, but now it's time to clean house. 
It's time to get real. It's time to study. It's time to take God's Word seriously. Now's the time because you're not going to get another time. And brothers and sisters, there is chaos in the world that's ensuing today, right? I mean, how many of you guys have turned on the news? I hate turning on the news. I hate going on any of the news networks. Fox is nuts. ABC is nuts. All of them are crazy because they all have their spin and they want to take it a different way, right? But you cannot hide your eyes when you see Iran is about to go to war with Israel. And they're sending drone strikes, right? That's scary. Russia says they're going to jump in, but they're already at war with Ukraine, right? The United States... We're talking about how, you know what, whatever you guys do, we're going to support Israel with it, right? This is a scary time. This is a scary time. Now, I can't tell you if it's the end times. I can't tell you if these are the birth pains that will lead to the ultimate time where we're going to be raptured and then the Lord's going to come back. I can't tell you that. But I can tell you that it's time to get serious with our relationship with the Lord because we don't know what times we're living in. For the nation Israel, the, the house of the Lord was in ruin. It had holes. It had leaks. It was dirty. It was run down. And the people did nothing. And they didn't even care. Why? Because it was a representation that they had forgotten the Lord. You could say that's the same that takes place today. Where churches are being emptied. Churches are closing left and right. Why? Because people are forgetting the Lord. But it also goes on to us, right? We need to go out there and represent the Lord in every area of our life and look at this as a time that we need to represent Him as the city on the hill, as the light of this world. Amen? Amen. This is the place where we... Yes, this is not the temple of Israel. okay, And we're not Israel. But this is the place where we worship Jehovah. We should be excited to bring others into that. We should be excited to go into our workplace and represent the Lord. Amen? We should be excited to go home and just represent the Lord there. Amen? You see, the people were putting off the Lord for way too long and they forgot about Him. Yes, they were excited to get back into the land after being away for so long, but they forgot the reason where, why they were even in the land in the first place. Who was the one that made the land of promise? They were so focused and fixated on the land of promise, they forgot the one that was the promise maker. And sometimes we do that ourselves. In fact, we do do that ourselves. We're so fixated on on the future of where we're going, we don't focus on the relationship that we have in the here and the now. Amen? Well, look what happens in the rest of the story of Haggai chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest with all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God in the words of Haggai the prophet. As the Lord their God had sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of the hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. What do we see here? We see that those remaining obeyed and they revered. They refocused their life. They started to live with eternity and a relationship in mind. 
You know, to revere something is when you see it as awesome and as dangerous. You see it as amazing and terrifying. You're enamored by it, but you're also fearful of it. God called on His people to consider and commit toward Him. To make a commitment toward Him. To make a commitment towards His Word. To make a commitment towards congregating. To make a commitment to go back to the Lord. And here's the reaction of the people. The reaction of the people is to actually do it. Just like when mama comes home and she starts yelling at the dirty house, the kids get busy, right? When dad steps on the Legos on the floor, the kids get down and start picking them up. The people heard God speak and they came together and they decided to make His house their home. They dedicated themselves to growing and knowing and serving the Lord God. Why? Why do that? Why is it important even today? I mean, this was written thousands of years ago, so how is it relevant to our lives today? If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, we, we see a very similar stern warning to believers about forgetting the Lord in the present time. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 Going down to 25. It says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He inaugurated for us through the veil that is His flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from all evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What we're being told here is we have confidence to stand before God, to go to the throne, to go into the the Holy of Holies. Not by the things that we've done, but by what Jesus did dying on the cross for us and raising again. Because we've been cleansed by His blood, because we can stand firm in the knowledge that Jesus is our Savior, it's like, man, approach the throne room of God. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Brothers and sisters, we need one another. We need love in our life. We need the love of Jesus in our life. We need to go out and do good. We need to assemble together and we need to encourage one another. Why? Because there's harsh days. There's challenges ahead. And there's evil that keeps on growing. And you coming here, you joining in song, you saying amen, you filling the seats, you giving, it all spurs on towards love and good works. Amen? Brothers and sisters, it's time. It's time for the people of the Lord to get serious about the things of God. It's time for us that when we read this, not to walk away blankly, but to live it out. Brothers and sisters, now is the time we need to use the moment in life to grow. We need to use this time to grow. We need to use this time to worship. We need to use this time that we're here on earth to focus on the Lord. Amen? And as a result of that, as a result of us focusing on Him, there's there's a promise that we're given in James chapter 4. Take a look at James chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Draw near to God. 
and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, O you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. Seek after God. Grow closer to Christ. Focus on your relationship with Him. This is a direct cause and effect in the relationship we have with God. Do you see it? Draw near to me, and guess what? Then I'll draw near to you. The more you're searching after Jesus, getting into His Word, praying and trying to please Him, coming together as brothers and sisters and being encouraged by His Word, the more that you're focused on serving and loving, guess what? He's in the center of all of that. He's in the center of all of that. Wherever three or more are gathered in My name, I am there also. But it takes spending time with Him. It takes, it, it's the same with any relationship. To grow, what do we need to do? We need to be communicating. To grow, we need to, we need to be listening. To grow in a relationship, we need to be talking and spending time. We need to put away all other things, right? Put away the laptop. Put away the cell phone. And spend time with the Lord. If we think it's rude when people do it to us, Man, I'm sure he, he can't stand it when our minds are distracted, right? And, and I'm not saying that I don't get distracted. You know, there's times when I'm you know, there and I'm worshiping and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, you know what, it's, is it getting too cold in here? I think it's getting too cold in here. I see people shivering. I should probably go and, and adjust the thermostat for people because it's probably a little too cold. I should go ahead and text John. Oh, but I don't have my cell phone, so I can't text John to turn off the AC. I'll go back there and I'll turn off the AC. I'll go back there and i turn off the AC. But was I truly focused on worshiping the Lord? No, I wasn't. I was focusing on you guys being comfortable with the AC. The life of a pastor, right? But we could do that, can't we? We could be distracted by so many things. When the Lord is calling us to focus on Him, because that's what matters. That's what matters now, and that's what matters in eternity. It takes focusing less on today and more on eternity. It takes less of me and more of Him. It takes letting go to follow, right? Don't we want to follow Him? Yes. Time is now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear precious and most heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You because the truths that were written thousands of years ago in the book of Haggai to the nation Israel as they were coming back into the land after being taken stand so true for our life. Lord, it's an example to us because we do the same thing. We get distracted by all the things in life. When the thing that we should be living in mind is eternity and our relationship with You. Lord, that's not to say that when we're, we work, we shouldn't work hard, Lord. That, that we shouldn't care about the things of this earth and, and try, Lord, and, and, and put forth our best effort. Lord, You tell us that when we work, we're working as unto the Lord. That when we talk, we're talking with grace in every moment. So Lord, help us help us to shift our focus on off of selfishness. Help us to shift our focus off of fears. Help us to shift our focus off of the distractions. To close the things that try to deviate and divide our minds and divide our church and divide our focus, Lord, and steal our focus. And Lord, let, help us just to, in every moment to seek You and Your kingdom first. Lord, it's time. We don't know if we're living in near the end, Lord, if, 
if tomorrow we might be raptured, Lord, we, we have no clue. But we also have no clue if tonight we're going to breathe our last. So Lord, help us to live every moment with You in mind. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that all of this just seems so foreign to them. They, they just, they're just struggling to understand about eternity and where, where they're going when they die. The Bible says there's only two types of people in this world. It's not a Jehovah's Witness, a Christian, a Catholic. It's not Muslim. It's not Indian. It's not Hindu. It's not black, white, red. It's none of those things. It's people that are going to heaven when they die and people that are going to hell where they die. Both are very re two really real places. Eternal places. The Bible says that there is one way to heaven and one way alone. There's only one way, one truth, and one life. And that's through Jesus. It's by believing that Jesus died for you and rose again that you have eternal life and you become one of those people going to heaven when you die. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. The moment you believe that Jesus died for you and rose again is the moment that you're given eternal security in Him. If that's you, could you just raise your hand and let me know. Pastor, pray for me. I'm putting my trust right now in Jesus. That He is the only way to have eternal life. He's the only way to get to heaven when I die. Lord, for everyone that's here, I pray that You'd help us to focus and recenter our life around You. That doesn't mean that we're to live blind to the things that are happening, Lord. It means we're to live with You in the center of all things, Lord. That when we're going to work, we're doing our best because of You. Lord, that when we're even talking to or reprimanding our kids, we're doing our best because we're representing You. Lord, that in every instance, in every moment of our life, we could live our best because we have eternity in mind. Because our relationship with You is the center of our focus. Lord, if that's, that's people in this room, let's just have a big amen for that. Amen? Help us to be a people that represent the light of Christ. We're not going to get it perfect every time, Lord. But it means we're striving. And we're making it your time in our life. We're setting it aside as something special. We pray this in Jesus' precious, most holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's all stand as we close with our final song. Your sting, your power is. His 
dead is my sin The cross has taught me to live And mercy my heart now to sing The day and its trouble shall come I know that your strength is enough The scandal of grace you died in my place, so my soul will live. Oh, to be like you, to give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like you. It's all because of you, Jesus. It's all because of your love that my soul will live. And it's all because of you, Jesus. It's all because of you, Jesus. It's all because of your love that my soul excitement that Pastor Cody was talking about or the desire we have to be able to share the news in our workplace. That was actually something we talked about this morning in teen Sunday school class, which if you guys don't know, every Sunday, 10 a.m., grade 6 through 12, we'll be meeting upstairs. And we were talking about the very first disciple, Andrew, and how when he first heard that the Lamb of God was here, Jesus arrived, he was excited. He went to his brother, Peter. And I think we could all relate to Peter because he is like the perfect depiction of how we would respond as humans. And he doubted. He was just like, who is this guy? Is he a doctor? Is he a teacher? Does he have money? Who is he? You know, Peter was doubting because Peter was very jaded about the things in his life, the internal strifes that his family was dealing with, the sickness, the financial woes. And he was looking for answers there to the point that he let his temporary circumstances define his internal outlook on life. And sometimes we could feel like Peter in our lives where we might not have the answer to something or we feel that doubt creep in. And that's why when it comes to our purpose, I love to quote Ephesians 2.10, which says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And even before Peter believed, God already had his purpose and his layout mapped out. And that's the same for each person in this room. And what I love about the disciples and the story that we learn there, or Cody with his siblings and the water war in their living room, is we're living this life together as a community, not in islands of isolation. And that's why this upcoming Wednesday, our church family challenge is to invite each and every one of you to come to our Wednesday night ministry. We're not just putting it on because it's nice to have or we want people to be here, but it's for us to be able to have an opportunity to be and have an investment in each other's lives, whether it's to encourage someone, whether it's to help carry their burden, whatever it may be. And we have Wednesday night ministries for all adults. We have a ladies group, mamas at SWCC. We have our general adult class class upstairs at 7 p.m. And we have Awana for pre-K all the way through sixth grade and the youth ministry from sixth grade to 12th. So join us this Wednesday. If you're new or visiting us for the first time, please stay in the back. We'd love to connect with you guys and we pray that you have a blessed week. Thank you.